Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to this event. My name is Ayat Soliman, and I am the Director of Sustainable Development in the Middle East and North Africa region of the World Bank. Thank you very much for joining us today to launch our latest publication, Blue Skies, Blue Seas, Air Pollution, Marine Plastics, and Coastal Erosion in the Middle East and North Africa. This report lays out very clear terms how unhealthy air, polluted seas, and eroded coastlines are affecting both economics and human health across MENA. You can follow the event in English, French, or in Arabic, and we have a very exciting lineup for you with opening remark by the World, World Bank's Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa, Mr. Farid Belhaj. And then we will be following that with a presentation of the report, and we will have with us two esteemed leaders from the region who will then join us to reflect and give their reflections, Her Excellency Mrs. Mrs. Yasmin Fouad, Minister of Environment from Egypt, and His Excellency Mr. Fauzi Lekja, Minister Delegate in charge of budget at the Ministry of Economy and Finance, Morocco, along with Ahmed Yassin, who is a co-founder and marketing strategist for an innovative company, Banlastic Egypt. Let me start by welcoming Farid Belhaj to make his opening remarks. Farid, over to you. Thank you very much, Ayat. Salah al-Khir, Masa al-Khir. Very, very good to uh, be with you, Excellencies, uh, friends, colleagues, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I am really delighted to join you today for the launch of our latest uh, report. Blue skies, blue seas, air pollution, marine plastics, and coastal erosion in the Middle East of North Africa, as was uh, uh, outlined by Ayat a few seconds ago. This, this report was prepared in very close consultations with uh, a number of our partners. And this is important because what we want out of this conversation is really as much ownership to this agenda and as much engagement uh, on this agenda as possible. So I'm really delighted to see. Uh, the minister, uh, Minister Yasmin Fouad from, from, from Egypt, Minister Fauzi Khza from, uh, from Morocco, being there and showing their support and their commitment to this. We are here to present a report, uh, but most importantly, as I mentioned, to really hear from you. Uh, because at the end of the day, this is an agenda that is our agenda, all of us, from Morocco all the way to the, to the Mashraq and, the, and to the Gulf countries. This is a common uh, concern for all of us. Some people would say it's a vital concern for all of us. As countries recover from COVID-19, there are tremendous opportunities for governments to build back better and greener for a more resilient and inclusive future. Cleaning up dirty air and polluted seas is a good place to start. While governments are subsidizing some green solutions too much support is still given to brown industries. And that leads to large pollution footprints. In fact, the Middle East and North Africa region is the only region in the world that has not yet decoupled carbon emissions from economic growth. And that too is really a matter of concern for us. We are looking at COP27 coming in a few months in, uh, in Egypt. We are looking at COP28 very possibly coming in uh, 18 months or, 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 or two years in the UAE. So we are smack in the middle of this global agenda. And we need, as a region, we need to tackle it you know, uh, head on. As you will hear from the report authors shortly, uh, the cost of air pollution, marine plastic pollution, and coastal erosion is alarming. Let me share a couple of numbers. And I will not be long because the report will be extremely explicit on that. In some countries, uh, more than 3% of GDP, 3% of GDP is lost every year due to the degradation of our blue natural assets. 3%, it is huge. Each one of our economies, of our government is fighting on a daily basis to grab you know, small fractions of GDP. And then when we look at the way you know, this, 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 this degradation of uh, blue assets is, is, is causing us, you know, we are basically, you know, uh, uh, rowing against a huge tide and we need to be aware of that. In the Maghreb region, coastlines are eroding at a rate of 15 centimeters per year, double the global average, destroying homes, destroying communities, coastal land and reducing 
precious revenues as tourists choose other destinations. Healthy seas are critical natural capital for the Middle East and North Africa region. Coastal tourism, which is a re reliant on clean seas and intact beaches, account for over 10% of GDP in several countries in MENA. Morocco and Egypt, two cases in point. So this is again, you know, it rings very close to home. And this is something that I know the two ministers are very much aware of. Air pollution costs the average MENA resident at least 60 days of illness over their, their lifetime. Uh, in 2019, some 300,000 premature deaths in the Middle East and North Africa were attributed to elevated air pollution concentrations. Marine plastic pollution is not uh, only an eyesore. It threatens economies, the lives of marine ecosystems, and poses health risks to humans. The Mediterranean Sea, our sea, a place that we all know so well, is among the most polluted in the world, with as, mu as much uh, a plastic flowing into it as the volume of fish taken out from the two most commonly caught species. <clears throat> so as you can see, restoring men as blue skies and blue seas benefits not only the environment, but the health, livelihoods, and the economies of those countries. The report you will see provide many concrete actions that MENA governments can take to tackle the degradation of blue uh, resources. This includes phasing out subsidies for dirty fuels and industries, capping industrial emissions, creating emission markets, while at the same time supporting the development and diffusion of green technologies, switching to cleaner transportation. And we in, in, in the bank are moving very much forward into projects that have a lot to do with cleaner transportation, stopping agricultural and municipal waste burning. And of course, adopting nature-based solutions for fighting coastal uh, erosion. As with every trans transition, there will be winners and losers, but one needs to keep in mind that even those losers at the end of the day will become winners. And this is something also that we need to keep very much in mind. At the end of the day, this is not going to be a zero sum game. We will all win if we move towards the right direction. Now is the time for government to be bold and take policy actions to restore blue skies and healthy seas through reforms and regulations, partnerships, investment, and by improving information about the sources of air and marine pollution. Today, in the discussion that we'll be having, today's decision will share we will, we will shape the trajectory of uh, men as economies for the coming decades. We ought to make sure that these decisions are the right ones. Then we very much trust, again, the decision makers from all the way to Maghreb, from Morocco, all the way to the Mashrab and, and, and to the Gulf to make those decisions and to make those right decisions. So thank you very, very much for being there. It's a pleasure and honor to have you uh, ministers coming and joining us today. It is important and you know, very much looking forward to hearing from you. So back to you, Ayat. Thank you very much, Farid, uh, for these very uh, passionate opening remarks. We know that you have been personally championing this agenda and pushing our teams to put the evidence where we can really uh, bring that to our policy dialogues in each of the countries. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Hager, our senior environmental economist at the World Bank, who will share the findings from our new report. And we will try to put in the chat the link. It is on the website available if you would like to download it. And also the hashtag, hashtag blue economy, one word if you would like to tweet about it. With that, over to you, Martin. Thank you so much, Aya. Thank you so much, Farid, for, for these wonderful opening remarks. Um, I would like to talk to you about the next 15 plus minutes or so about the main findings of our, our report. And before I do so, I do want to thank my, my co-authors, Lucas, Annabella, Mala, uh, Marjorie and Marcelo. Okay, so let me jump straight into it. Um, in the beginning of the report, we take a look of the historic development in MENA over the last 30 years or so. And we find that when we look at economic growth, we see an average rate for the entire region of about 3% of GDP per year. And when we look at some of the underpinning capital uh, of this economic growth, notably you see in blue down here, uh, the produced capital and in red human capital, we also see by and large improvements over these last 30 decades. Um, and 
uh, indicators such as infrastructure quality, road road quality, uh, sanitation access, access to to to, to water um, have been improving. So as access to electricity, and on the human capital side, we also have seen tremendous improvements in the Middle East and North Africa over the last thirty years. That said, I'm sure you can all think of exceptions to this general trend for, for, for this monolith of 20 plus something countries. And in particular there, we of course think of the conflict afflicted countries, or we can also think of indicators of particularly distribution where things haven't been necessarily improving uh, as much as we would have liked. But generally speaking, the story of menace development on these forms of capital is a positive one. The same cannot be said, unfortunately, about uh, natural capital, and in particular, renewable natural capital, that is. What we see in the report is that virtually any indicator that we look at um, and try to analyze shows deteriorations, significant deteriorations, as it were. So uh, what we're trying to do in, in the report is focus on, on the blue subset of these uh, na uh, natural resources, and in particular, select the three priority challenges to blue uh, assets, as it were, air pollution, marine plastics, and coastal pollution. Uh, sorry, coastal erosion. Just to foreshadow one of our main findings, as, 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 as Farid had also mentioned, we get to a quantificate, we quantify the economic losses just of these three combined factors to about the equivalent of about 3% of regional GDP every year. Now, for the remainder of my time with you, I would like to take you a first topic by topic and then synthesize and conclude uh, uh, bringing them together in, in a pitch for, for bluing and, and, and sustainably growing uh, the Middle East and North Africa economy. Um, let's start with air pollution. MENA has an air pollution problem. It is in fact the second most ambient air polluted region in global comparison, just shy of South Asia. And to put it differently, the air, air pollution in, in, in MENA cities exceeds that of the WHO guidelines by about 10 times at, current, at the current moment. There's good news and bad news. The bad news is that unfortunately this has been deteriorating over the last couple of years. The good news is that there are signs, pockets of improvement all across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and I'm, I'm very thrilled that we'll be joined later by Her Excellency, uh, the Minister of Environment, Dr. Yasmin Fouad, who will hopefully tell us a bit about some of the policies that ha have helped in that improvement in the recent decade in Egypt towards cleaner air. Now, arguably why we care most about polluted skies is because of its uh, uh, direct implications for human health. Um, in this graph here, what you can see is that we quantify that the, the, the deaths caused from air pollution in the Middle East and North Africa are the same as these other six risk factors that we've also listed here combined, being road injuries and these five very significant and prominent, of course, diseases. Um, when we quantify the nominal value of premature deaths each year in the Middle East and North Africa, we get to almost 300,000 people. And then ultimately, what we also do in the report is try to quantify these losses uh, the, the, to the economy, monetize these implications. Notably, of course, they have uh, implications for productivity and cognitive capacity. And quantifying that, we get to, to a value that is just from air pollution alone, about 2% of the region's GDP each year. Now, before we can think about solutions, we want to get, of course, a strong handle on where the sources are. And uh, in this graph, uh, we display some of that analysis. And to some degree in North Africa and the Middle East, we have similar but also differing sources. In North Africa, for example, road vehicles are, are a significant contributor. In the Middle East as well, but to a lesser extent. In both uh, sub-regions, waste burning, on the one hand from agricultural residues, but on the other hand from, from municipal waste burning, um, uh, be that by households or be that on the dump sites, is a significant contributor to, to poor air quality. Industrial processes are a significant contributor in both regions. And then finally, in North Africa, agriculture is a strong uh, culprit. And in the Middle East, it's, it's power plants. Now, what can be done about cleaning up uh, the, the air in the Middle East and North Africa? And, and I really strongly urge you, if you could, to, to look at the report. Um, because I can only go so far in so far into the policy recommendations in, in my short limited time. But, but for, for one, we, we, we recommend improving and better disseminating air quality information. 
there's much to be pushed still on, on, on information uh, gathering, but also on dissemination of the information. We, we, we've looked in various, various cities that have, uh, that do collect data quite well, but, but then ultimately uh, do not reach the, the residents. And it's important, especially for the sensitive population, people like me, asthmatics, who, who use this very information to, to protect and, and, and amend our behavior accordingly in accordance with forecasts. The second point, and Farid had also touched upon this, is, is in pricing that emissions, pricing the pollution and creating emissions markets. MENA is the only region in the global comparison that doesn't have a price or a market for emissions. And that, of course, has, has good reasons, and those reasons being largely that to, to, to a good degree, many countries are still subsidizing fossil fuels. Um, uh, and therefore, Although we've seen good progress over the last decade or so of many MENA countries removing fossil fuels gradually over time, I'm thinking of Egypt, I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia, I'm thinking of Iran, but there's also many others moving in the right direction. It's important that this further reforms of fuel, fuels of, of fuel subsidies is continued in an inclusive fashion, thinking about especially uh, uh, lower income households, of course. Um, cleaning mobility. And, and here the recommendations are to start fostering a switch from personal and personal motorized transportation to non-motorized transportation and to cleaning the motorized transportation uh, that is uh, remaining. Cleaning production, here in the report, we review many international best practices and from the, from the region itself on, on how emission control technologies, resource efficiency and fuel switching, switching to cleaner fuels have had tremendous Benefits, benefits for, for air quality. And ultimately stopping waste burning, which requires a symphony of policy choices, in starting from improved solid waste management to reducing the waste to begin with, to stopping the burning of waste by banning it, to creating markets for what can be done with the agricultural residue and, and of course with, with the waste material that is no longer that should no longer be burned. Switching on to moving on to our, our second topic, marine plastics. Now, marine plastics, of course, doesn't make for pretty beaches, but it, it goes beyond that. The, the plastics is a pernicious uh, item in that it remains for decades in the ocean until it decays. And that also has implications for human health because the plastics as it decays, decays into smaller and smaller particles, ultimately to these fine particles called microplastics, as you see in this picture above. And that in turn enters the human food chain, um, uh, which uh, has likely significant health its consequences. Um, and in, has been found already in several organs, uh, including the, the human placenta. Um, and researchers are beginning to best, better and better establish those causal links. Now it also has implications for the economy. Of course, uh, thinking of the fishery sector or the marine transport sector, uh, uh, um, um, uh, boats get, uh, drains get clogged and, and ship, ships get damaged from it. But then also uh, the tourism sector gets uh, affected negatively because either tourists are deterred from a beach like the one we show below or because it has to be uh, cleaned up extensively. Now, when we look at MENA's contribution to the global challenge of, of marine plastics, We'll find that in terms of global, uh, in terms of the global problem, MENA is rather a small player, uh, and its contribution is rather small, and that and that has mostly to do with the relatively modest population size of MENA compared to say the bigger culprits, as it were, in East Asia and South Asia. But when we break it down by resident, we actually find that per resident, MENA tops out the global ranking, and that has many reasons. One reason, of course is that plastics is a superior product still to many non-plastic alternatives. It's more lighter weight, it keeps food longer, it is the superior choice for many logistics operations. It has, it has some physical attributes that are not yet rivaled by alternatives. Another reason, arguably possibly even a more compelling reason, is because it's much cheaper. And here in the report, we, we compare virtually all uh, information from all, all, all 20 so many countries, and we find the same pattern to hold everywhere. The non-plastics alternative is at the minimum three times more expensive. And that, of course, doesn't, is not conducive for households or industries to switch. Um, another reason is, of course, waste being mismanaged in the Middle East and North Africa. What we've done here in this analysis in the graph to the right, we've 
subcategorized the MENA region to Maghreb and Mashrek, as it were, and taken out the Gulf countries from Mashrek. And when, when we do that, we find that the remaining Mashrek region, as well as the Maghreb region, have a combined of 60% of, of waste that is being mismanaged, and therefore ultimately causing leakage and, and then uh, ending up in, in uh, to, to, big, to, to significant parts in, in, in marine spaces. Another reason is, of course, that you have relatively low recycling rates in the Middle East and Africa. Now, what can be done about it? Uh, on, the, on the first, of course, improving the nuts and bolts of solid waste management, including the strengthening of, of recycling infrastructure. On the other hand, and very much in line with our, our finding also from, from the air quality uh, section, is, the, is setting the economic fundamentals for a circular economy. Currently, plastics, uh, virgin plastics, outcompete their green alternatives uh, as we shown earlier, and they outcompete recycled plastics. And a lot of that has to do with, with, with the fossil fuel uh, uh, policies that are currently in place. So it's really important to rethink that price incentive scheme such that uh, alternatives are uh, becoming more, more attractive for consumers and industrial um, uh, agents. Then the solutions also include levies and bans for some of, of the most pernicious forms of plastics and, and implementing recycling mandates. Of course, critical to the plastics conundrum is also strengthening uh, a waste conundrum, as it were, is strengthening private sector roles. And this can include putting ownership and responsibility more on the producers of plastic, uh, of, of a product, so that they also hold responsibility of, of that product through its lifetime. It also includes supporting green alternative industries, industries that are developing alternative solutions to, to, to current plastic solutions, and investing in, in R&D and technology. And finally, it sounds trivial, and I don't have time to go into it, but beach cleanups are very effective in terms of stopping the plastic from, from doing that last mile and entering this, the seas. Our final topic, coastal erosion. Um, this is a beach um, resort called Les Sirenes in Gerwa in Tunisia. And this is 1992, literally three, 30 de no, three decades, as it were, from now. Uh, and what you see before it is a beautiful, expensive beach. Go on TripAdvisor, there's beautiful images of this hotel still. But look at what this hotel looks like 30 years down the road. Uh, it's literally been eaten away by, by the coast and it's closed. No tourist would want to go to a place like this, of course. Now, looking at the residential example, this was a tourist example. What you see here is the beach of uh, Hamamet, this town south of Tunisia. And this is... Uh, if you look at the sliver that's orange and the sliver that's yellow combined, you get to the beach as it was 2006. When you take away the yellow line, uh, sorry, the yellow area, you're left with the orange area. That is the beach that is remaining in 2019. And when you look at the speed, try to quantify the speed, which we did in the report, you get to an average rate of three to eight meters that the coastline is receding each year, depending on where you are along that coast, of course. Now, the next question we asked, we do this analysis for, for the entire coast of the Mediterranean, but here we just select the Tunisia example to the left and the Mediterranean coast of, of Morocco to the right. And I just want you, if you could, to focus on the hexagons that are reddish in color, red, pinkish. All those are similarly fast coastally receding as the examples that I've shown you earlier. Now, when we look at the aggregates, it's in particular the market sub-region in the Middle East, North Africa that's challenged by coastal erosion. And in fact, it's the second fastest coastal eroding uh, area after, after South Asia. Um, and we quantified that damage cost also in terms of destroyed assets, but whether those are buildings or, or land areas, and get to significant uh, numbers as you can see before you on this slide. Um, on top of these costs to assets, of course, there's also a cost in terms of reduced economic flows as tourists are, uh, of course, deterred from returning to a beach that is no longer there. Uh, now, before I talk a bit about the solutions and then switch to my last slide, um, I want to uh, share, I think, a bit of the paradigm that one ought to adopt when one looks at coastal erosion, which is, I think, a paradigm of that this isn't an inevitability. These are not uh, uh, problems that can't be overcome. Just think of Venice or many parts of the Netherlands where areas are flourishing and teeming with economic activity that without engineering solutions would be underwater. So none of this is an inevitability, no matter what uh, sea level rise projections show. 
This is an important message. And then accepting that paradigm, the solutions range from, of course, first identifying the source of a pollution, sorry, of an erosion at a particular hotspot, because it varies widely. Second, starting to kickstart a coastal zone integrated management process, engaging various stakeholders. And then thirdly, thinking about the solutions bespoke for each hotspot. And there, thinking about nature-based solutions first. That isn't to say that uh, gray solutions, hard solutions, seawalls and groins don't have a space, but that is to be saying that many countries, and we're trying to push on that, um, in, in many experiences we've seen nature-based solutions have a similar, if not superior performance than gray solutions where they're fitting. And also on top of this, all the economic, uh, the environmental benefits. And then of course, complementary control policies. My final slide, and to conclude, what we've tried to show in this report is that the brown growth path of the past three decades or so, if we can term it that, had significant human, social, and economic costs. What we're arguing in the report at the end is in particular, or throughout rather, is that switching to sustainable, blue as it were, growth path um, is important for the future, particularly now as, as countries recover from COVID. And this could be a window of opportunity for switching to, to bluer growth paths as it were. The three reasons that we outline in the report for why that is a particularly critical uh, effect for, for, for the Middle East and North Africa is on the one hand, of course, because it avoids the, the health, economic and social damages. On the other hand, we've collected evidence that green investments or blue investments as it were, have higher rates of return in terms of GDP growth, but also in terms of jobs than, than, than brown uh, investments as it were. And finally, uh, it is important we think that MENA countries prepare for the economies of the future, the low carbon, the, the, the low pollution economies of the future, and not lock themselves into an economy of the past. With that, um, I hope I did my best to, to summarize the 400 page document in, in these 15 plus minutes. Thank you so much for your attention. It's, it's, it's really appreciated. Shukran uh, Jazilan. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you so much. O over to you, Ayat. Thank you very much, Martin, for this excellent presentation. Uh, and showing the urgency that is needed in terms of efforts to address these challenges and, and, and really safeguard our blue assets, but also the images that you've put up that really show what, it's, what is at stake. And I think it touches all of us in terms of what we know of MENA and what's at stake. So let me now, it's my pe pleasure to turn to our distinguished panelists. And I would like to start with Her Excellency Minister Fouad, who is the Minister of Environment in Egypt. And uh, Your Excellency, you have been, first of all, greetings. It's great to see you. And you have been a champion of this agenda, uh, probably many years before it has uh, come to the forefront as a regional and global agenda as well. So, and you're also at the center of the road that will take us to COP27 and Sharm el Sheikh later this year. Could you share with us uh, maybe your in, in a summary, the recent initiatives that Egypt has undertaken to blue its skies over Cairo in particular, but also if you could from where you sit share, what, are, what, what does it take to achieve results? What are some of the challenges that really are at, uh, uh, on the road to taking these actions that Martin has uh, highlighted that are needed to safeguard these assets, whether it is in terms of investments, but also in terms of policies? Why is it difficult and how can we make results last? Over to you, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayat, for that. And hello, everyone. It's a pleasure. Merci, merci beaucoup. On, Bien bonjour à tout le monde. Très heureuse d'être avec uh, vous. We can hear you well. Nous vous entendons très bien, Madame la Ministre. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, thank you for, 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 for this panel. Uh, let me try to answer the two questions. What are the recent initiatives and uh, uh, where are the challenges? Uh, first of all, I think that it really takes a huge political will and political commitment to work on uh, issues related to air pollution uh, and uh, facing the adverse impact of climate change. Either we're talking about the air pollution or the greenhouse gases emission. And in Egypt, we have uh, worked so hard to change that part in the way of how the president had 
uh, been able to include the environment at the heart of the development process at a very uh, speedy and dynamic process of making development in Egypt happening in infrastructure and in everything environment uh, started to be at the heart of that. So number one, I think the most important initiative that we've done was to put the environment at the top, at the top agenda of uh, the president and the prime minister. Secondly, when we come to see the sources of pollution in Egypt, uh, whether uh, like all other countries in the MENA, we're talking about the waste sector, the transport, the industry, and so forth, I think that one of the most important initiatives that we've done, for an example, to stop the open burning of the rice straw that, that has caused the black cloud each year in Egypt, was to have, first of all, an integrated multi-stakeholder plan that's adopted at the level of the cabinet, and that's done each year. And each year, we have an operation room that is being uh, uh, launched at the level of the prime minister and at the cabinet that provides daily report during that uh, time of the year. That time of the year, people in Egypt would not be able to leave their houses after 6 p.m., and those who had some asthmas and things like that would go to the hospital. The way, the first thing was to do an integrated multi-stakeholder plan that would ensure that each one has a role and we report on that role. And that plan is endorsed at the level of the government. That's number one. Number two, and here comes the role actually of the Ministry of Environment. Actually, the, 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 I think that one of the most uh, 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 unfair things to the ministers of environment, uh, and I'm sure my colleague uh, in, in, in Morocco and, and others share the same thing, is that they are responsible for every single source of pollution that happened at the national level, and they should go and sit in the chair of other ministries, which, with, which they should not be doing. So the first thing is to organize the kitchen and have that multi-stakeholder integrated plan with roles and responsibilities and clear lines and roles and responsibility and accountability. And that we're talking about the governance structure. Secondly, how can you provide more financial model for the farmers for an issue like that in order to be having more incentives into that process? Like when uh, Martin was presenting, how can we recycle more waste? How can we reuse more waste? How are we able to reuse the agriculture waste, like the rice straw to create the compost. And that is another source of income that comes uh, to them. And third is the awareness thing that we uh, would go at the level of the locality and discuss with them those kind of opportunities. Another important thing is an, 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 a financial mechanism that provides job opportunities other than those kind of seasonal or temporary jobs at the level of the rice straw season is the initiative of the biogas. How did we train, train first and, and provide uh, small loans to the youth in order to construct, develop, and maintain the small household biogas unit at the level of the rural village? And this was the first thing that was integrated in Hayekarima. And now we have around 30 companies that has been uh, developed, not by the start of Haya Karima, even before that, three years ago in Upper Egypt, that are training other youth on how to provide job opportunities by the recycle of the agricultural waste and the animal waste. And we have so many examples, even at the level of the initiatives, we cannot do that. And that's the most important thing without having a very solid background of creating an enabling environment. And when we're talking about enabling environment here, we're talking about law, we're talking about the policy reforms that is needed at the national level. And we're talking about the, the responsibilities and, 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 and regulations that would support that. In Egypt, we have done the first ever waste management law. Everyone thinks that that law is um, assigned only for municipal waste. That is a one kind of a law because it, it, it draws the picture for this country based on the concept of circular economy. It's, it's a very integrated and very intense way of, of, of writing that law is not only collecting the garbage and recycling that. It deals with the concept of circular economy. And, and, and we have even the part of the extended response uh, 
uh, producer responsibility. We have announced the first feed-in tariff for the generation or the conversion of the waste to energy. And today we have finalized the contracts with the prime minister, with the central bank of Egypt providing loans to the investment. And now they are taking over the lands uh, for the first eight pilot projects of waste to energy in Egypt um, in, in, in next month. And finally, having more, uh, uh, what I would say, awareness on, on how this is not a hinder to the investment, it's an opportunity. Changing the narrative around the environment, around the green part, and not using the green just as a, a nice word to be used, but really make a difference at the national level and changing that narrative in reality by very small examples of pilot from different sectors that would work very well. The challenges I would like to tell you here, uh, not only uh, in my capacity as the Egyptian Minister of Environment, but also as my capacity, uh, in, my cap in my current capacity as the chairman of the uh, Arab Council uh, Ministers for the, uh, for the Environment Affairs, which uh, I'm honored and privileged to, to, to be chairing uh, this year. Uh, that one of the most important challenges is the finance and the technology transfer in the MENA and North Africa. I can hear Martin very well when he was talking about the challenges and how policy reforms would be done and all those parts like the carbon market and all the things that he has been mentioning on, on, on things that needs to be done at the national level. But believe it or not, we really have a problem with the finance. And one of one important part is that it's not only the finance, but also the access to finance. And that's why Egypt is um, taking over this year the responsibility to submit uh, by April, together with our colleagues from the Arab countries, uh, the first climate finance strategy for the Arab region. We've done the assessment and we're launching that in April. But that should be coupled also with the technology transfer and what kind of incentives that could be done because Alone, the finance will not do that kind of anchoring the solution to the local level. We always forget about how are we doing that and, 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 and how can we uh, make it really happen. The, 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 the one other challenge that I think is really important at the level of the MENA, whether at the level of the marine pollution or the air pollution especially, is the distribution of information. At some point of time, Governments would feel that the, the, they don't want to reveal the information on air pollution because that is a problem. We have passed through that process in Egypt, and it took us quite a long time to do that. Now we are uh, able to face it boldly <laughs> that we have an air pollution problem for the next three or four days. And we publish that openly on our Facebook page, on our website. We respond to questions, but believe it or not, the public in the beginning did not want, they, they started to criticize us and everyone would say, we need to stop that. But they have to be aware, how can we tackle an air pollution problem in a city that will take years, okay, to reduce its pollution level, to tackle the waste, to tackle the transport, to tackle the industry without informing the people. If we keep the people in the dark, we're not doing any good. So we took the battle, we took the fight, and we now announce our uh, problems related to air pollution. We say we're having the crisis in the next three days. Um, uh, old women and men should not, go, should not go out from their houses if they don't have to. Please go, come back to us. And we receive phone calls. Some criticizes us, but some appreciates that we are at least very transparent in trying to educate them. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ayat. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasmin. I think you've highlighted a number of really important elements from a very uh, practical and policy-oriented point of view in terms of the enabling environment, that partnership that, that uh, needs to be created, uh, the coordination, and some of the challenges. I also want to really highlight, and I'm glad we will hear from uh, uh, Ahmed uh, later on these opportunities for young people in terms of jobs and, and opportunities in the green space. Many countries are now looking at where can they create more space on that bandwagon on green development and green transition to create more domestic production and domestic uh, technology uh, uptake. 
uh, at their level that can benefit the youth. So you've really highlighted a large uh, cross-section. Now let's uh, turn to Blue Seas and uh, Minister Lakja from uh, Morocco. And you have been at the forefront of addressing uh, climate change in the region. We have seen the coastal areas, we've seen the dots. Let me ask you a first question first and then a follow-up if you allow me after. Um, could you first tell us uh, about the challenges you are facing in developing a sustainable blue economy in Morocco and what have been the most recent initiatives that you have taken to this end, again, knowing how important the coastline is for Morocco's growth and development and livelihoods for people. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Minister, Mr. Vice President of the World Bank, my region, my region gentlemen. I'm so delighted to uh, be with you and to take part in this uh, very important uh, gathering on a very topical issue, which is blue economy, which is uh, a domain that is uh, in the heart of uh, our development policies, uh, knowing its enormous potentials and its capacity to generate wealth, jobs, but also in its capacity to uh, create environmental uh, sustainability and uh, above all social cohesion and as you all know the uh, kingdom of morocco has uh, placed uh, sustainable development uh, um, not only as a slogan but it has placed it in the heart of its uh, public uh, policies during uh, the last decade you perfectly know that we have hosted COP. Per COP22, we have launched a certain number of very heavy investments, which uh, allowed us today to be amongst uh, the world leaders in uh, clean energy generation. With the help of the World Bank, we have also been able to launch a certain number of uh, programs regarding urban transport uh, that is based on sustainability and environmental sustainability, but also uh, in terms of uh, domestic uh, household based management. Then I, I need to recall that the Kingdom of Morocco has uh, a very, very long and important maritime capital on both uh, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. We have an exclusive uh, economic zone of a great wealth. And of course, we have uh, our uh, uh, huge fishery capital and untapped resources that are still to be exploited. Uh, not uh, to mention the fact that uh, the majority of our economic and social activities are concentrated on our literal 58% of uh, urban population lives uh, uh, on the seaside and 80% of our industrial uh, fabric is uh, overlooking the sea. And of course, more than 50% of jobs come from there and more than 59% of our GDP comes from the literal. This uh, demonstrates the importance of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and the challenges that we are facing, but also the necessity to preserve those uh, activities uh, to uh, allow for development in a context of sustainability. So all what I just said depends uh, to a large extent uh, on the health uh, 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 state or the soundness of uh, uh, the performance of those uh, uh, the, those um, domains, the performance of uh, jobs, uh, uh, value creation, economy, economy uh, performance. So, and as it was um, properly described in the report, 
this performance uh, unfortunately uh, is threatened by climate change on the one side but also by um, an increased pressure on those marine and maritime systems uh, namely um, because of the over exploitation of um, fish uh, fishing resources because we certainly face uh, multiple variable um, equations. We have incitations for development and exploitation of resources, but at the other side, on the other side, we have to do that in a balanced way that guarantees sustainability. Uh, you spoke about plastic pollution, knowing that five years ago we have forbidden the use of light plastics in our country, etc., etc. I say all that, knowing that all these uh, actions uh, have placed our country on a prominent place in the development puzzle, uh, knowing that our region is still vulnerable to sharks. What are the principal sectors uh, of blue economy uh, in our Moroccan uh, marine spaces? Of course, there is uh, uh, fisheries, uh, maritime transport, uh, seaports. Uh, we have uh, great projects in that field, but of course, um, we have tourism. And every one of those sectors have developed its own plans and development strategies. Uh, which has uh, required uh, a coherent uh, approach, which is a huge challenge for me, with the different sectors in order to avoid the conflict, uh, conflicts uh, arising uh, from the competition between those uh, different sectors. So, and if we add up to that, uh, emergent activities or potential activities in Morocco uh, should be able to uh, develop to boost its blue uh, economy, like agriculture, like uh, seawater dissemination, the um, exploitation of offshore uh, gas or um, oil uh, wells, sectorial or unilateral management approach will not be enough. And this is where I uh, tend to agree with uh, Madam, uh, the Minister of Environment in Egypt today. Uh, if we talk about policies, we need wills, w will and uh, action, but at the same time, we need uh, a convergence program, a structuring program that uh, safeguards limits and at the same time respects uh, interactions with a view to safeguarding uh, sustainability and getting out from the exponential development in silo of development. We have, of course, this huge maritime capital in Morocco, and in this framework, we have uh, put together two actions in order to uh, guarantee a stable, sustainable development level with the help of a series of reforms and actions that, of course, will have to be uh, enhanced. To, this, of course, will lead me to the second question of your uh, questions. We have, for example, the National Strategy for uh, Sustainable Development, the law on uh, uh, the sea um, fronts, uh, regional development plans, etc., etc. So these are as many examples, as many visions and laws that were put together, adding to additional measures that were introduced in our country, like for example, uh, fishing TR, uh, uh, TRQs, uh, uh, standards in terms of uh, fishing boats, uh, um, maritime transportation. So the fundamentals of blue economy in Morocco are already there. And of course, there are uh, bases on which we can build uh, for a national strategy for blue, for an integrated and sustainable blue economy in Morocco that guarantees perspectives for, uh, for growth and also durability and sustainability. Thank you, thank you, Mr. You have covered 
quite a lot of what I wanted to ask you for sort of a follow-up, which is what are some of the innovative plans that you have in mind in the coming period for implementation? But you already talked about that, those transformative elements and the plan ahead for the government. So um, if you allow me, I will go to uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed Yassin and ask him to share his uh, views. And also then uh, we, we see if there are any questions to all our three distinguished panelists. Mr. Yassin, you founded Banlastic Egypt which is working towards reducing single-use plastic and promoting plastic alternatives. And you also established a new platform called Solar Egypt, building a network across factories in Alexandria and Egypt to promote the use of clean energy as an alternative to fossil fuels. So tell us first, how do you see these priorities that we highlighted in the report in terms of reducing marine plastics? How relevant are they for the context that you see? And is there a market for plastic alternatives? How can we help create them? Um, good morning, good afternoon. I think it's um, you know different time since, but I'm really happy to uh, to be here and also um, uh, have a special greetings to Her Excellency Dr. Yasmin Fouad, uh, the big motivator and supporter to my initiative. And also, she uh, really um, had a very great uh, approach um, regarding uh, the environmental scene in Egypt, and I'm really thankful for that. And I'm lucky that I'm part of this environmental scene. So yeah, I have a very important question also. Uh, yeah, I, and also greetings to the distinguished guests, uh, Mr. Fauzi and Mr. Farid. I would like to quote three uh, important keywords that have been uh, mentioned by also uh, uh, the political will mentioned by Her Excellency Dr. Yasmin Fouad is very important. And that comes with a very, um, you know, unique strategy on how to work on uh, the development phase, especially in climate change, which is uh, the triangle of development. And I see it's very important, the government, the civic society and the community at the same time. Uh, that what happened exactly with Ben Lastic or other, you know, initiatives I've been working on is how to include uh, both, uh, or sorry, the triple uh, sides in one equation. And even, uh, which is very important, what, what happened, that the government now is uh, supporting not just with a, 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 a working on different levels to be uh, precise that what's happening on a political level and also on a grassroots initiatives at the same time. And that expedited the process a little bit in Egypt. Now uh, we, we can see the Minister of Environment talking and advocating for uh, the, uh, the green markets and the green um, alternatives to the single use plastic in a project, which was a pilot. Now it's expanding all over Alexandria. And that's the most important thing that I've uh, seen even in 2021 and 2020 in, uh, in times of pandemic. Also, a very important thing, that I'm, I'm praising the efforts of Morocco, that they have a, a very uh, brilliant initiative on phasing out of the plastic, and maybe they are one of the, you know, the unique countries that have did that. Uh, it's a crossroad between, of course, the Mediterranean and the uh, Atlantic Ocean, so it's, it's a little bit very important to highlight that and uh, in inspires also the environment is seen in other uh, Arabic countries or Northern African to be specific. So uh, the here I can say yes, that we have um, a green market, we have an alternative products. We've been seeing this uh, and uh, I would like to say that uh, Martin said a very important thing that it has to be competitive with the, the plastic, which is now uh, it's happening with different factors I have to mention. So uh, the first one is uh, we had a, a ban on the single use plastic clause in different um, uh, cities like or different governors like the S South Sinai, a red uh, sea governorate and also we are phasing out uh, from uh, uh, other cities and now we are uh, looking into the Ky in Cairo and Alexandria, uh, the capital and the second capital of Egypt. So it comes here with how the you know the the convincing the suppliers to be producing more alternative products and that happened when the the when we you know saw the markets are flourishing so what happened exactly with the, the south sinai or the red sea governor that they are now they are asking for the products uh, singly uh, sorry the alternative products of uh, to to the single use plastic from 
our uh, you know platform that we made a green platform and it's flourishing because of this the ban on the single use uh, plastic claw uh, been drafted by the ministry of environment and approved by the parliament so this is very important on how to create the markets at the uh, and that's a very and a massive big step also the to uh, one of the you know the missions of Manlastic is to convince the suppliers to go for uh, or to uh, develop more products that can be cost effective. And now we are putting the plastic as a main competitive, not the uh, the other green entrepreneurs and uh, or green initiatives or uh, or companies. That's uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, made a very great uh, space to flourish the products itself. So we've started with the tote bags. We started uh, then with the cutlery. Now we have dishes or bagasse plates or which is uh, alternative to the single use plastic and it's made in Egypt locally. Now it's not pricey. It went from 10 pounds now to 3.5. And now we're trying to make it more competitive with the plastic dishes, which costs around 2.5 if it's the fancy one uh, and 50 piastres for the not fancy one or the low quality. Also the waste management law, which is uh, uh, we are really great and uh, we've uh, been through it. It helped the grass news, uh, roots initiatives and my company and other companies to start, uh, you know, uh, having a different tactics or adv advocacy to what we can do regarding the alternative products, because now people think that, uh, OK, we have uh, a sector that we have to work on with efficiency, so we need to a little bit phase out of the the low quality single use plastic and we can go for alternatives so we can be part of the equation and that's uh, that's the triangle i've been speaking about in the uh, at the uh, first uh, part of the talk and um i would like to highlight also uh, what uh, mr farid said that we've uh, in 2020 and 2021 Egypt in different levels have seized the opportunity to get back greener. So it's not just uh, we've uh, sur like we've surrendered to the pandemic or what's going on. No, it's it has been some efforts. So in 2020, on an initiative level, we've been doing lots of cleanups, uh, many cleanups in, in the north coast of Egypt and in Alexandria, and uh, which uh, actually uh, I have to second the words of Martin that the 40% 40, 40 of the single-use plastic doesn't crowd, don't crowd to the our seas because of these initiatives. And along with the Minister of Environment, which is a massive partner. Uh, we've been doing um, what we call it a very trendy thing in Alexandria, especially because it's an overpopulated city, the second capital, but at the same time, it, it receives 2 million visitors a year in the summer season, and I think 1 million in the, uh, the, the off season. So that means that creating such trends with the government or also in the grassroots initiatives raise the awareness of the people or, uh, of why they are using um, uh, or they don't have to use single-use plastic and to go for the alternatives. And they've been asking around the questions along with them, even uh, uh, what happened, that why we are doing this and why we are going to the alternative uh, to the single-use plastics. Mean also that we've uh, quoted both on a governmental level and initiatives level that the health uh, is, uh, is vulnerable and uh, uh, very important that we've mentioned the microplastics because uh, in Egypt uh, people are, uh, get frightened by the any health issues so they start no we have to go or to shift to a better solutions and healthy solutions uh the green markets now i can say it's um it's just a start and we're going after two or three years because of the great uh i can say the legislative uh a part that we're taking and also thanks to the uh the her excellency uh that it, it will give a, a, a very important track to the suppliers to be motivated and to work more. And that's happening. And now the, the, the costs are really decreasing. But we what we want to is also to raise the quality to be competitive with the plastic and to be, um, you know, uh, not just uh, convincing with awareness or lecturing people. No, we are giving a sort of a proper solution on economical level too. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, this is really excellent from on the ground, you know, experience on, on how the markets are shifting. 
Before I hand it to Leah for some closing remarks, I'd like to give uh, an opportunity for our distinguished panelists and to Farid to give us any uh, parting thoughts in terms of the future for MENA and uh, will MENA be on this global green map? Uh, will we seize these opportunities that are existing in terms of shifting markets, shifting uh, consumer behavior, shifting uh, understanding and demands, but also of course, increasing risks as we've seen in this report. And I wanna also from my side, thank you all for participating and sharing your insights, and, but most importantly for your leadership on this. And I will start with Dr. Yasmin, and then I will go to uh, Minister Lecha and then uh, Farid. Thank you very much, Ayat, for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to give one um, small comment on, on, uh, on what actually uh, uh, both uh, uh, Farid and Minister Fauzi and, and Ahmed has been mentioning, um, is that uh, the only way for the MENA is, is to, to move out of that and reach that blue skies and blue seas is the way of putting the agenda forward. And putting the agenda forward by having, I'm still very much convinced that the multi-stakeholder platform that uh, is open and giving enough space, but yet roles and responsibilities to everyone, where the government regulate, where the private sector assign responsible and accountable for their action, where the grassroots and the civil society have more safe space in order to innovate and apply and implement an evil a trial and error in that part works. But also what's really important and I can see that in order for all the bits and the pieces to fall together is to focus and not to um, neglect the education system of our youngster. And that we have done as well. In Egypt, we have integrated, uh, believe it or not, those global environmental issues of the biodiversity, the nature-based solution, the climate change, and environmental sustainability with, with those very complex terms, even for those who are well-educated in universities that are not responsible for environment, are difficult to understand. We've created that curriculum with the new educational reform system that Egypt is taking. And we've included that starting from year from six years old till 16. So what I'm saying is drawing the map for the MENA is not difficult and is not impossible. It can only happen when we all join forces and everyone has a seat in the drive through sustainability. Thank you, I. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, Minister Fauzi, over to you. Any parting reflections on your side? Merci, Madame. Thank you. Donc, uh, ce que je pourrais dire en... So, to conclude, I can say that in the Kingdom of Morocco, as you know, we are concentrating on the new development model. And by 2035, we will be working on solving the many problems that I mentioned. First, concentrate on the economic development, growth, job creation on the one hand, but on the other hand, protecting and concentrating on natural resources in order to reach these goals, the government in Morocco decided to start a partnership with the World Bank. And the partnership include a broad program based on results in the framework of the National Economic Development Blue economic development and it also in this perspective the sustainable development of coastal areas and in this partnership also 
we want to enhance integrated framework for the blue economy and have a central coordination based on a unifying national strategy, a blue strategy that will take into consideration the socio-economic challenges. And also we will need to concentrate on the productive sectors with the right governance in order to allow for an interaction and a genuine dialogue between all sectors, tourism, fisheries, environment, economy, finance, ports, infrastructures, woods, and so on. Hence, we will have an interministerial commission created, and its mission will be to make sure that the project and programs are coherent. And the commission will make the important decision that have an impact on the blue economy. Creating this commission will allow for us to feed the blue economy and to make it a priority in the government's agenda. And this, of course, within the framework of the partnership between the Kingdom of Morocco and the World Bank. At the territorial level, we will have coastal clusters in different marine areas. And here we want to concentrate on the synergies, efficiencies, and coherence of scale economy in different sectors. It will be based on new development model in order to build this cluster at the territorial level and also developing the nine main coastal areas in Morocco. And this will allow to enhance the coastal clusters development. A second important goal in this partnership is to be able to carry and implement the program for the blue development. We want to create a series of projects in the Ministry of Economy and Finance, because we believe that in order to succeed in these synergies, in order to have coherent contribution by all sectors, we need to have a centered guidance in the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and its mission will be to deploy and implement the program according to our commitments. It will be in charge of setting the agenda of the blue economy. So we will be carrying this task while mobilizing all actors through new approaches based on the behavior researchers, but also on the collective leadership in order for this program to be a success. The program, of course, with the World Bank for the blue economy, and it is part of the new model of development in Morocco. Thank you. very, very uh, proud to be engaging with uh, the kingdom on uh, very timely. And as you said, really looking forward, uh, a forward looking program that brings uh, uh, together all the stakeholders with a lot of ambition ahead. And definitely the bank is very much looking forward to supporting it. Also in Egypt, our program and our partnership on air pollution and climate change is a, is a very important and one that we are also extremely proud to be engaged in. With that, over to you, Farid, for any uh, final reflections before we close. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you to uh, both uh, ministers for sh showing a clear vision uh, as we move forward. Let me make a couple of points. One relates to the, uh, you know, I'd like to be as concrete as possible. Uh, 
when I, when I look at the way Egypt and Morocco are positioning themselves and broadly the whole MENA region vis-a-vis -vis the large markets of today and of the future. The Euro European Union is one of its, of the biggest markets for Morocco, for Egypt, and for a number of countries in MENA. The European Union now has adopted the EU Green Deal. So by 2030, there will be a huge incentive for each one of our countries to be looking at the EU Green Deal because that's the only door open to engaging in this you know, multi-million consumer market that is at our doors. And for that, we need to transform the way we are managing our economies. Minister Lakjar knows that because last time when I was in Morocco, we spoke about the Nador project, for instance, which is an open door to the, Europe, to the EU market. And we want to be engaged, of course, with that. And we are engaged in that, in that particular project. And we believe that this is one concrete step for Morocco to open the door for uh, the engagement with the, with, the, with the EU. When it comes to Egypt, of course, Egypt has the same incentive and the same type of you know, uh, ambition to engage with the EU. But at the same time, Egypt has inside you know, this very large, ambitious, you know, I would say, president, presidency marking project, Haya Karima. It is huge, it is important, and it is transformational. And that particular ambitious program has in, in, you know, in itself, a very, very heavy climate uh, 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 agenda and climate di dimension, in addition to the whole social dimension of that project. If you allow me, both, both ministers, I'd like to make a parallel. In 2005, Morocco adopted the ENDH, the National Initiative for Human Development. At the time, of course, the bank was engaged in that. And at the time, the, 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 the idea was social protection. But then as the you know, time kept you know, uh, rolling, we found out that there was also a huge job creation and climate agenda in the ENDH. The same thing I would say is in Haya Karima, which is exactly the same philosophy. Social protection and making sure that, you know, you, you, you have a more of a coalition of social forces around a common uh, social protection and development agenda. So that for us is, for all, all of us, meaning around this big table, is really where we should be going. Concrete and transformational agenda. Uh, a third point I'd like to make relates to uh, this whole conversation that we've had related to you know, job creation. When we look at the climate agenda, and earlier I said that you know, there will be losers and winners, but even the losers would end up being winners. Um, looking at the Middle East and North Africa today, and this is going to what Minister Yasmin Fouad mentioned earlier, I see by 2050 the need to create 300 million new jobs for the young people of the Middle East and North Africa, from Morocco to Iran, all of those countries. Those 300 million new jobs are not going to be coming from the public sector. That we all know. So there is a need for us to transform our economies into economies that attract private investment. And you know what? That private investment today is very much tilted toward green and toward engaging in a green agenda. So this is also where we in the bank and, and beyond the bank, we would really like to push this agenda because it is not only good for everybody's health, good for the economy, and also good for the job creation for those young people who will be coming to the job market in the coming years. Or they are coming as, as, as we speak. So this is a multi-layered and multi-dimensional agenda that we are engaging in. And you know, count us as your partners, the way you have counted us as your partners for years and years, whether it is Egypt or Morocco, you know how much, how close we are uh, to you and how much close we are to your, to your agenda. So thank you so very much. I really think, uh, I hope that I will be meeting with both ministers, both either in Cairo 
and in Rabat very soon, hopefully. And in the meantime, thank you so much to the team for having put, put all this together. Martin, great report and great presentation. Thank you, Ahmed, for uh, giving that perspective. It is a very important one. And of course, Ayat and Leah and uh, all the team around, uh, around, around the back. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Farid and distinguished panelists. And without further ado, uh, I hand it over to Leah to close the session. Uh, thank you so much. And I think at this point, it really leaves me with the pleasure to thank you very much, uh, dear distinguished panelists and excellences, and dear Ahmed, really for this inspiring, but also provocative um, statements and, and presentations. I've, I've personally learned a lot, particularly the discussion on, on what Egypt has already achieved and what's, what is being planned moving forward, particularly also on the air pollution agenda, and as well as uh, Morocco on the blue economy agenda. And I think that is, it's really at this crossroads and how to address making sk skies and blues as, as seas bluer. Uh, moving forward, but also in line with economic development. So really very much for that and sharing these um, experiences as well as from the private sector, which are indeed extremely ex inspiring and very much welcome. And I also wanted to use the opportunity to thank to the very many listeners from across the region and beyond who have also carefully listened and are also inspired from, from your from your speaking points and allow me to use again the opportunity really to stress the findings of the main report which is the deterioration of the seas and skies which really have indeed impacts on life and livelihoods of the residents in the regions and in fact the report found that the degradations of skies and seas alone in six significantly erode the gains of development. And you've heard the figures. We are looking here at 3% of regional GDP per year. And I think that's quite, quite significant. And here, particularly, the cost of inaction should be a report, important reminder to us that going forward, we need to better ways to continue to grow um, the economies. And here, particularly the transition to a sustainable growth path along the line that we have heard many, many times on green, resilient and inclusive is really important. It's important from the region. And as we have heard from your excellences and as also from Mr. Ahmed, that many, many countries are already embarking on, on this process. As the transition to a green, resilient, inclusive development really outlines not only holds promise in terms of making growth more sustainable and with fewer costly environmental degradation, but also offers more opportunities of returns of investments as well as instead of business as usual growth paths, as the report has shown. And in conclusion, I really would like to thank you and thank you for your participation, for your inspiration, for your guidance to us, and we look forward to continue working with you in making MENA skies bluer and MENA seas bluer as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.